Hey everyone, hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes, good, 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 good. <laughs> um, so firstly, I'm super honored to be sharing the stage with my uh, fellow panelists um, to talk about this very interesting topic. Um, we're going to cover stable coins, the landscape of stable coins, what's happened in the last 12 months, the regulatory landscape, what are stable coins, where do we see the future, what are the challenges. Um, to start off with, and hi to everyone who's watching virtually as well, my name is Riz Pabani. I'm a Partnerships Manager at the Cardano Foundation. Um, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves uh, first, if you say your name, where you work, um, and then maybe we can get into some questions. So starting with Connie. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Connie Bloom. I am the co-founder and managing director of Mesh.Trade. So we, we fit into the world of blockchain and decentralization is that we run a multi-sided platform that is tokenizing, selling primary and secondary markets, settlements, and lifecycle management of financial assets mostly. I'm Matt Plowman. I'm one of the founders of the Mehen stablecoin project. We're building USDM on Cardano. It is a stablecoin that's built much like USDC in a regulatory capacity where it's backed one to one by uh, US dollars in a reserve account. And the Oracle, the Charlie 3 Oracle, has a direct feed to the reserves and reports them every day on chain. So we can be the most transparent, most assured uh, fiat backed stablecoin that there is. Amazing. Is that good? No, no. Mic check. <laughs> did, did you turn it off when you sat down? Uh, how do I turn it off? <laughs> I'm not sure. Can't. Is that good? Okay, no. that's good. That's good. I can hear myself. Uh, we've, got, we've got help. We can't, we can't, we can't hear you either. Oh, we might have a Mac backup mic for you. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> this is much better. Yes. I can actually work with this. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> closer. Here. Closer. Okay. Hi. I'm Zygo. No, no, line as Zygo Meb. Um, here representing mostly Optim Finance on Cardano. Um, the project has seen quite a lot of success so far. We have created mostly lending and borrowing for um, quite a unique feature of Cardano: staking rights. And we're looking into expanding ourselves into more of a yield product type of uh, project. That's it. Thank well, you. Awesome. Thank you. So, stable coins. Um, some of us have heard of them. You know what they are. You might have heard of USDC, USDT, and all the different chains they're on. But maybe it's good to start with explaining exactly what is a stable coin. We've heard of deposit tokens and, and other acronyms and terms used out there. Matt, maybe you could give us a bit of an intro and tell us, set, set the scene for us a little bit. Yeah, sure. Broadly speaking, stable coins are an on-chain token that's meant to represent the value of a dollar. And so you can achieve that many ways. You can do it algorithmically by having a token that is stable and then a token that lies below it that takes all the volatility. Or you can do it by pairing the asset off-chain with the value on-chain. So if you have a dollar in a bank account, you have a dollar in a stable coin, that's an even pairing and you can redeem between the two. I think in, in both cases, one of the key advantages is if the stability mechanism is transparent and easy to use, then you'll be able to achieve on-chain stability just through trading arbitrage. So you'll be able to see a stable value on the DEX or on a centralized exchange, regardless of whether the asset is balanced or not, you'll be able to, to achieve that stable value on the chain. That's useful in a lot of ways because if you're doing tax planning or if you're doing some sort of payments to, to individuals who live maybe outside of an area where you can send your bank deposits, then you'll be able to send them stable coins, you can engage in payments, you can engage in a lot of real world services and, and, and functions by using stable coins. You can also engage them in trading pairs. If you'd imagine a lot of Cardano projects are heavily dependent on the adoption of the Cardano blockchain. And so if their token is traded versus ADA, that's doubling the volatility because they already have operational, vo operational exposure to Cardano. Not only do they have that, but they also have their token exchange versus ADA. So they, they double the risk or really you know, square the risk. Sta stable coins take, take, take that, that end of it out. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe building on from that. So you know, we, got, we have the fiat back, we have the algorithmic ones, but maybe Connie, if you could go into like, and I, and I think Matt started touching on it, but like, who were, who were the main users of a stablecoin? Do, like, do, do you see them as kind of developers, consumers, or businesses? 
Um, wh wh why do we need them? I think stablecoins is one of the loveliest assets that we have in the blockchain community because it basically serves everyone. The secret sauce around a stablecoin is that it brings in liquidity into any market. So whether you're actually using it to develop and transact, um, to share value, to go into remittances, um, to base your NFT on, uh, what is very interesting of the community that we serve and what we see is the impact of having a good quality stablecoin actually underlying your real world assets. Because your real world asset needs to be denominated in some form of value. And generally, uh, this is where the TradFi and the DeFi world collide because you need to show in a good quality value, and generally that is dollar, what is something's value. So if I were to put it out into the market today and I sell it, what is that, that, that value? And now when the contractual world now meets the world of tokens, are you going to put a dollar down there? Or are you going to say it's denominated in USDC? Are you going to say it's denominated in USDT? Whatever you choose, there needs to be a stable show of value that you can actually transact on. And even if it's not a real world asset and it's a service, it's something to denominate that service or asset in. So the, the, the audience for Stablecoin is actually as far as the sun can shine. So developers, investors, issuers of tokens, project runs, um, you name it, there will be a, a market for Stablecoins. Amazing. And so, so we know they're ubiquitous, basically. Everyone's going to be using them everywhere. Um, and I guess we, we probably have a lot of uh, folks in the audience here that, that are run protocols or run businesses that are looking to come into Web3. Um, so I go, maybe could you talk a bit about what should they be thinking about when they're thinking about which stable coin or how do I, how do I integrate a stable coin? Um, what, what sort of things has this from a bit more of a technical and business angle, like what, what should they think of? Right, so for Cardano, mostly, since we have uh, our wonderful community here in Cardano Summit, um, we need to consider our available options right now. So, for a protocol building on Cardano, there are really two options right now. Uh, not considering bridged assets and not considering Mahan, because you guys haven't shipped yet. Soon? All right. So, two stable coins. There is JED and there is IUSD. Starting from the bigger one, IUSD, is not really known for keeping the best peg. It tends to have quite a volatile nature for a stable coin. It tends to, tends to hover between 92 and 96 in recent weeks, cents on the dollar, which is not really something that a real stable coin taking protocol can work with. There is a real reason why a project such as um, Liquid Finance has not decided to allow IUSD as collateral. What, what, what Indigo really is uh, and have, has done with its design is take the brilliance of liquidity, um, that's a protocol on Ethereum, um, that, that has seen a lot of evolution over the years. Um, but what, has, what Indigo Labs has done is rip out security features and peg protection uh, methods from the system. And now we're stuck with what is essentially an asset that weakly tracks USD. And as a stable coin, it, fa it fails to protect the lower peg, as I tend to refer to it. In contrast, JED, which is currently unable to be minted and as such can't scale uh, to large and large capital needs and as such, uh, is extremely capital inefficient. Um, it keeps its peg well enough. It, it, that is a good thing about JED. One good thing I can say about JED is that for, for, a, for a protocol, taking it and assuming it, it, it to hold at least one dollar worth of value is a pretty safe bet. On con other contrast, it can go pretty much as high as it wants to in value. So there are pretty degenerate edge cases where JED could see going <laughs> above two dollars even, yeah. which is pretty amusing. So yeah, those okay. guarantees on how much the peg can vary is ultimately the biggest consideration of the protocol willing to and looking at integrating with a stable coin. And secondly, how much can it scale? Yeah. And 
as, as I have illustrated, both of these protocols fail in one or the other way. Yeah, so you want your stable coin to be stable, yeah, noted, very good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, one of the things I wanted to talk about was so last year we had this kind of regional banking crisis in the, in the US, we had SPB, Silvergate, collapse, um, we saw USDC got caught up in some of that. Um, and, and that was really like a traditional finance issue uh, to do with, uh, I, I guess, their portfolios of government bonds. But um, be interesting, Matt, maybe from, from your perspective, because I know you're, you're based out in the States as well, what, 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 what does that mean for you when you're building your fiat-backed stablecoin? Um, what, what do you think it does to the sort of regulatory landscape or, 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 and the communities of people wanting to use stablecoins? Well, I think you were, you were exactly right in saying that the failure of US, um, <coughs> the failure of the USDC banks, so they were Silicon Valley Bank, Silvergate, and Signature, they, all of those failures were not due to USDC. They were due to mismanagement of the assets and liabilities of the bank. But what they really did lay bare is the reality that when you're investing in a stable coin, or when you're not investing in a stable coin, but when you're building a stable coin and investing the proceeds that back the stable coin, you need to be very conscientious about the kinds of risks you're taking with that portfolio. The one thing that USDC or Circle did with USDC that was wrong was they put way too much money in each of those banks. They put way too much cash in these various edge banks with an expectation that potentially they could get outflows. But they didn't necessarily expect that the bank itself would fail. Now luckily, due to some last minute gyrations with the FDIC, nobody lost any money at Silicon Valley Bank and the other two banks that failed because the FDIC came in to rescue not only the insured depositors but also the uninsured. And so USDC then re regained its peg and did have all of the assets that it had deployed at those banks regained. But what it does do is it, when, when, when somebody from outside the ecosystem sees an event happening that is blockchain adjacent, like the failures of these banks, if you're in a different bank and you don't understand the technology, you don't understand how these tokens work, you don't understand the actual machinations of all of it, you may think that you might also be at risk if you were to be a bank for a stablecoin. And so what it did was really put up the guardrails on all of the fiat partners that we had established at the time because we were looking at uh, Silvergate, we were looking at Silicon Valley Bank as partners for USDM. And they were very good with the the fiat rails and doing the, the technology of the banking, but they would not have been good credit risks for us to take as exposure and counterparty. So we were very fortunate that they failed before we were able to launch, but it was one of those cases where, while well, these banks that touch crypto failed, so now every other bank, and bankers do not understand crypto at all. Nobody in financial services is, is even aware of or cares a bit to learn about this, this industry. And if you find somebody that's in traditional finance that learns about this industry, that's going to be a, a very valuable person coming soon. So those are they're very rare cases. And so when you don't understand the ecosystem, you just are naturally scared. And so just the entire fiat system kind of pulled back from crypto. I think we saw that in a lot of the other uh, L1 tokens, so the, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum and the ADA and the, the different tokens that, that ended up losing a lot of value as sort of the bank side pulled back from, from, the, from the sector in general. And I mean, because, because of that whole incident, do you feel like the space is in a better place now? For particularly, uh, you know, one of the things I've been reading about there is that there's this new bill about stable coins in the US and lots of other parts of the legislation coming into maturity for, for Web3. Like, do, do you see this as now, you know, can we accept that stable coins are really going to be part of like the world now, or do you, do you still see that there's like a, like a zero tail risk that p potentially they could disappear at some point? I don't know that they would disappear. I think that the, the, the main threat to stable coins that people always talk about is a, the rise of a CBDC. So instead of having dollars at, uh, on, a, on a private company that's issued them, you have dollars that have been issued by the bank on your blockchain. And I don't know that that would be exactly a good analogy to say as a big competitor. Because right now we do have a central bank in the US, we have a central bank in, in most of the world that, that, that serves the banks, and we have the banks that serve the people. I do not think that the central bank, despite the conspiracy theories about wanting total control over everything, want to bank millions, hundreds of millions or billions of people individually. I just don't think they want to have the capacity to, to bank retail. So I think that there will always be this stablecoin layer between the CBDC and the, the base layer of the people. And that's the hope 
in building Mihin is it will bring this functionality to people from the community. Great. And Connie, I know we were going to talk a bit about CBDCs as well. Um, maybe, could, could you tell us like, what, anything about your experiences, about what, what, what do you think that they're going to take off? I know there's been some examples in the world, like India, China, they've come up with CBDCs. And I mean, do, do you feel like they will be the ultimate stablecoin killer, or do you think that they'll still be a use case as well as Matt's kind of alluding to as well? So I think what I can add to Matt's point is that when someone launches a stablecoin out into the market, they're so focused on having this algorithm um, keeping track of all their bank accounts and the, the rails ultimately going in and out of their stablecoin that they forget that you have to manage your credit risk, as you mentioned. And that good quality risk management policies is part of your algorithm at the end of the day of managing your stablecoin effectively. So that being said, that means that the stablecoin market on the one side needs to mature more. It has to mature into a space where it can have large scale adoption of where big liquidity providers such as banks can actually adopt it so there can be more flow happening in those stablecoins. And I do agree with your view of saying that stablecoins will not fall out. They will have that, that, that middle ground, but I think they will have larger than a middle ground because every good market has competition in it. That is what it means to have a liquid and um, fair market occur. So there will always be place for stablecoin because not everyone actually wants to take central bank risk at the end of the day. And I'll give you an example here of where this actually becomes very practical because I think a lot of people in the audience come from countries such as uh, the Emiratis that we're currently in, the European Union, and from America. So if I can put an example in front of you of an African country um, in where they actually do not currently have trust within the banking uh, industry and most probably in your central bank digital currencies as well or your central bank because you cannot actually invest into your retail government bonds in, in these countries or your gubbies on stable, which is supposed to be your zero risk asset at the end of the day. You just mentioned, both of you, that uh, one of the risks coming through on the USDC crisis was that they didn't manage that base of um, good quality assets very efficiently. Now imagine you're in a country on which you base a large part of your reserves on your central bank issuing good quality government bonds. These government bonds start defaulting. What is going to happen to your central bank digital currency as well? Because that central bank digital currency becomes part of your monetary policy management. So it becomes part of your currency circulation. So all these things are always interconnected. That's the, that's the secret source about the financial industry. We're all interconnected and we can all learn from each other, but we can all fail together as well. Very good, yeah. And um, so more, more stable coins need to stay stable as well. Really, really important. Um, <laughs> Yet again, the point. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just thinking about like if I, if I was going to build a, a stable coin, um, so I go, I know you're, you're building one on Ethereum, is that right? Uh, Ra no, Radix? No, no. Radix. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, that's uh, yeah, one, one is on Radix and uh, we're also building one, potentially more than one on Cardano as well. So, yes. so, so my question was kind of coming towards um, like reserves. So I know one of the important things about stable coins and CBDCs are kind of proof of reserves. And, and I think one of the best things about blockchain is the sort of transparency you get from being able to prove something um, and be very transparent about where things are. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about like how important that is, how, what the mechanics of, of how that works potentially in, in some of the solutions that you're looking at? Right, yeah. So recently we've seen on Ethereum uh, a wave of, I would call it, stable coins starting to pass yield back to the users, the holders, with savings die, with SFRAX, all those stable coins which passed basically zero yield now are passing treasuries back to the chain holders. So, and pretty competitive, especially on SFRAX, because they issue additional yield back to the users based on the percentage that is actually staked. So that is a pretty important note in an optimization uh, on their part, actively measuring supply and demand for that yield. And that allows their users to actively express their desire for uh, risk engaging in their protocol. 
and as such, the users of that protocol are rewarded for holding S frags. Um, so, managing reserves. Currently, on Cardano, we do not see any protocols really making use of that. The only protocol that I can safely say does any management of its reserves is Liquid. What, what they're doing is uh, any lending marketplace, any money market, needs to ensure sufficient amounts of their reserves, the supplied assets, are available to be withdrawn. It's, it's kind of the same thing as banks, really. Um, with with Avalee-like types, such as liquid, um, you have a floating rate dependent on the percentage of the supplied assets that are borrowed. Th this, this means that, uh, in effect, um, they behave kind of like banks in this sense. Um, but generally, looking at more advanced um, reserve uh, strategies, basically, you'd be taking a look at what is really yearn types. Um, yield aggregators, really. Um, their reserves need to be somehow allocated across the DeFi ecosystem in a transparent way and in a way such that those strategies cannot be exploited by nature of those uh, protocols being extremely open about what they're doing and extremely big in size. So uh, for, for any strategy that a protocol adopts, uh, they need to be able to be confident that not only can they scale, but also their strategies do not fall apart when they get to a sufficient size. Which was the case, you can argue, with Luna. Once they got too big, they simply fell over and there was no way to, you know, look, at, look into the pockets of their investors and, you know, bring it back up. So, at a certain size, certain ideas simply fail. And despite high capital efficiency on the UST, of the U.S. Treasuries, <laughs> the Terra Luna, yes, it's the same. It's incredibly funny that, that that's the same word as being used for both. Not uh, signaling anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again, stable coins need to be stable. Yeah. And U.S. Treasuries need to be stable as well. <laughs> They're not, actually. They don't need to be. And, and that's actually the mistake that was mentioned um, by my co-panelists here. Uh, that's the problem that banks had. They didn't manage their reserves appropriately, yeah. and that really what is what, co what it comes down to. And do, do you think we'll see like central banks adopt some of this technology to prove their reserves as well, or do do we just kind of go on trusting what they're saying is on their balance sheet? I think the closest thing we have to like a crypto central bank is Binance. Um, so using them as a, as an example, they do proof of reserve but they don't do proof of liabilities. So there is reason to believe that those banks would behave in a similar way. Will they do it? Will they not? Yeah. But let's help them get their non-blockchain assets blockchained or tokenized. Um, they, they don't like that word, tokenized. Um, so we can have insight into what is happening on, our, on their balance sheets, have insights in what is happening in their accounts. Um, because you're always going to have this disconnect between your token balances and your token accounts and where your underlying asset is lying, unless that asset is effectively tokenized and managed in the same way. Yeah, because I feel like if, if we were able to get more tokenization done in the traditional finance world, I, I feel like it would just increase the trust in the system as well and weed out anyone that's acting maliciously. And, and I, I feel like that's something desperately we need to do. And hopefully you know, we, we have some of the solutions coming in the pipeline in the next uh, little, little, little while. Um, Matt, I was going to ask you about when you're thinking about USDM and, and how you came to the decision about building on Cardano, uh, was it was it like an easy decision you had to make? Because like, I think everyone has to sort of pick a pick a blockchain at some point. How how how, how do you go about making that sort of decision? Yeah, that's not how, that's not how Mihan happened. Um, we're not a stablecoin looking for a blockchain. We were from the community a blockchain uh, that needed a stablecoin. So Mihan is built by stake pool operators, by programmers in the community, by people who have come together to try to put this thing together. So I was, I was in Cardano, I went to the 2021 summit in New York, and I met a few people from Cardano. I have an old friend I went to college with who's a member of the ADAO and Summon team who told me to check out Cardano, it might be fun for me. And I, I, I didn't, until, you know, for years, he, I dismissed whatever he said about blockchain. 
because I didn't want to know anything about it. And then in 2020, um, you know, the, the, the money market space, the, the front end of the capital markets nearly collapsed. And we tried to find, you know, so I started thinking about maybe peer-to-peer -peer trading funds would be a thing we can do. Is that a, something that a blockchain can do? I don't know. So I asked my friend Adam, and he said, yeah, well, you can come and try Cardano and can come and see. And so I went to the summit and learned more about it. I ended up uh, you know, making some, you know, running a node and doing some NFTs and making, my wife is a, is a writer, and so we published every chapter of her book as an NFT uh, every, every week as she wrote it. And so that got me interested in the, in the chain. And when I was talking with everybody, they said, well, you know, there's, there's Jed that's coming, it's going to be a great stable coin, and it, it's, a, it's a fairly, you know, fairly strong structure when it comes to being, uh, you know, safe, but it's also got limits and, and problems. So uh, I said, well, that's not the, it's definitely not the way to go. You, there's no, there's no, there's no variance-based uh, parameters. There's nothing to incentivize more shen minting. There's nothing out there that's going to make this actually work. So uh, well, may, maybe, maybe we can look at something else. And so I started thinking about it. I proposed to my employer that we, we start, should launch a stable coin on Cardano during the week that uh, Terra Luna happened. And so they were not interested, and they said, if you want to go and make one, go ahead and make one, we'll leave you alone. And so that's, that's, that's how we ended up making USDM. It was really out of the need of the community that the community came together. And if you look at Cardano, you look all around the room, you know, most of the projects that people use on a daily basis are from the community and built. Uh, you know, the, the, the founding entities have done a great job of, of promoting individuals from in the community and building things that are essential. But when it comes to the things that, that you and I use every day on chain, they're all from the community. My eternal wallet, my Vesper wallet, my Hosky token, my exchanges, my, you know, all of the JPEG store, uh, Inmaker, uh, Charlie 3 Oracle, all of these things that come from the community tend to be great. And so I think that that's really where Meehan is, 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 is placing itself. It's where we've, we've come from. Uh, you know, rather than just being a, a project looking for a blockchain, we, we are a blockchain that needed a, needed a stable coin. So that's, this is where this is coming from. That's a beautiful answer, um, and I think you're absolutely right. I think the community is the way we're going to really drive the change in, in the world that we, we want to see, right? And um, I know we, we've got we've got Connie here from Mesh, and, and you guys are building some amazing things as well. And uh, Connie, maybe if you could talk a little bit about um, some of the things you're building, because I think it'd be great to also talk a bit about why stablecoins are important within that tokenization realm. Because, um, I mean, it, it's, it's such a great use case as well, and, and it's really going to change, you know, move, move the dial forward in the traditional world as well. Yes, so I think when you walk the room, there's going to be a lot of people that talk about platforms and marketplaces and exchanges. And when we started Mesh or Mesh Start Trade, um, we looked at what is going to be our unique selling proposition. Where are we going to fall into this market? And especially overlaying that with the complexities that is the capital and financial market. So when I looked at this market, there was five things that stood out for me. So firstly, it's asset creation. Secondly, it's the selling of those assets, so trading. Uh, some people will go and they will spew a couple of big points here, primary, secondary market, uh, auction, subscriptions, yes, all those things, they trade. Then we're looking at settlement, we're looking at um, ownership, and then the last thing is life cycle management. So all the assets that we are involved in are complex financial assets. So we're looking at anything from a bond to a preference share to a weird option butterfly structure. Um, and we thought the blockchain community came up with weird names. Hey, the TradFi guys did it first. Um, so we look at these assets and we issue them, we tokenize them, we sell it on our marketplace, we settle them on chain, and then Everyone has ownership in their blockchain accounts, and then we serve them over their full life cycle. So as I alluded to at the start, uh, with all these assets that we put out in the market, they need to be denominated in something. They need to be valuated, they, but they don't need to, to be valuated just the once. They're not a currency. A currency gets its price from the FX kind of market or the daily trade value that's, that's, that's running. But a bond, a equity, and so forth gets priced in a slightly different way. Yes, there's supply and demand, but then there's the true or real value of those assets as well. So we denominate it in a currency. And this is where it gets interesting because the, the traditional world of contracts could now collide with the, the world of smart contracts. And it's difficult to explain to someone that a smart contract is actually not a legal representation of 
yeah. that asset. And and I'm sorry if I offended someone here. And yes, you can argue with me that you can maybe um, program everything that occurs into a smart contract. It's not true. When you start going into situations such as default, you cannot program in human agency as well. So this is where we our worlds now start to collide and we sell an asset in a stablecoin, we settle it, so delivery versus payment for, 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 for stablecoin. Uh, but now we also have to wor deal with the world of uh, what happens in, in the actual contract. How do we value it? What happens if mesh falls out of the, the, the picture? What happens if that stablecoin falls out of the picture? What happens if the token falls out of the picture? So we need to uh, control those elements or at least give the investor a way out or a way of resolving this because they're still standing in the line with the rest of the credit citizens and debitors in, in, for, for that company's assets. So it's not just the trading, it's the valuation, and then it's also the, the, the continuous ownership of those assets then as well. So let's say it does go outside the, the world of just a mesh. What happens if I still have a USD treasury bill, which is on a token now, but on mesh it trades in USDC. But if I bring it to the rest of the Cardano community, why can't it trade in your stablecoin? still the same currency-backed stablecoin. So how can we make these worlds speak to each other? How can we still make these denominations speak to each other and these valuations speak to each other? And these are some of the core problems that we're looking at and, and thinking about, even though we're just tokenizing the assets. We're getting confronted with these problem statements as well, because we're not just dealing with a bank and an asset manager, but we're dealing with everyone's money at the end of the day. So if I'm a normal retail investor, I also want some of these answers and some of these protections as well. And we're hoping that the rest of the Cardano community can also come together with us to resolve some of these issues, because it's not just a single party, as you mentioned. It's a community-based incentive to move this market forward. Absolutely, yeah. And I, and I feel like we're going to be in this kind of hybrid area for a while where you have this sort of traditional markets infrastructure with custodians and all the intermediaries they have for all sorts of securities. And then, you know, I feel like at the moment we're just trying to spend some time trying to replicate that on chain. So you get some of that transparency, some of the governance and things that we also bring in blockchain. Um, but what would be interesting is talking about a bit about Optim, because I guess in blockchain as well, you do have the kind of fully decentralized uh, finance protocols as well that aren't necessarily relying on traditional assets as well. Um, and they kind of stand alone somewhat, but I mean, it's like, well, how, can you talk a bit about Optim and what, 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 what's, how, does, how does DeFi work with the, with the stable coins? Well, it works pretty well. <laughs> it works remarkably well. In fact, without them, it's, it hardly works at all. Um, really, uh, the, the type of product that drives DeFi forward is any sort of attachment to a real asset. We've, we've only seen uh, the rise of DeFi through like a massive amount of uh, dollar-based stable coins that have been issued uh, all over the environment. So uh, I'm really looking forward to Mahan launching so that we can bootstrap this economy forward. Uh, at the end of the day, someone at the end of the trade chain needs to uh, trade into a reference asset. And the only refer reference asset that we do have is USD. And without any asset at the end of that daisy chain of assets being exchanged, it, uh, it falls apart. Now, we do have something called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is yeah. pretty good. Bitcoin is pretty, pretty great. We all love Bitcoin. ADA is pretty great too. And it has done its best job to emulate Bitcoin's success as a proof of stake network. Now, now with that in mind, we can argue that we cannot build economies at scale just on blockchain alone. That's a fair argument, philosophical more, more so than otherwise. Um, but currently, uh, it all comes down to the regular users who cannot be working uh, in crypto alone. Businesses who need dollars, need dollars at scale, need reliable dollars. And, and, it's, and it all comes down to dollars, not euro, not Polish slot or any other. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you going to tell me you're going to issue PLN? I have some in my pocket right now, actually. Because oh, <laughs> I gave them to you. <laughs> no, but, yeah, so, so here, see. Oh. That's 50 Polish bucks. 
that's just like worth you know 10, 10 real dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, dollars, that, that is what it comes down to because that's the most liquid asset in the world, arguably, I think. But, I, I, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Well, I think that at some, at some point you end up encountering the meat layer, right? You start off in the L2 or the L1 and you eventually get down to the meat layer of the human. And you'll need to find a way to, if you're building a stable coin, if you're building a real world asset, if you're tokenizing anything that interacts with the, the meat layer, that you need to actually interact with the social layer as well, which includes the government, includes law, includes the, the regulations that, that encompass it, that, that, that society has built. And so to the extent that we can maybe move away from that and into the blockchain world, we can have reference assets like Bitcoin, we, we can imagine a world in the future where Bitcoin is the reference currency for the world, where everything is traded versus this immutable, you know, how, you know energy hungry um, you know, token. That, that's, that's really the, the, the ultimate goal. But yeah. in, until we get there, we need to build up all the systems that, that, that need, are necessary between here and there. Right, without actual users using the token, the stable coin, uh, as a reference asset, just by its virtue of holding value, by being useful to them alone as a currency, mm. we cannot build finance on top of those. If it, if it cannot be used for trade, it cannot be used for anything else, really. And it's all just, you know, apples and oranges. And that's, that's the kind of criteria for success, I guess. Like, when we know we've got something that is kind of ubiquitous, being used everywhere as, as a means of value exchange, right? I mean, maybe just because I know we only have a few minutes left, maybe if I could go to each of you and just ask, um, what do you see as kind of one of the, one, one challenge each of the next, you know, period? So, like, in terms of, stable coin adoption or how important they are, if you could talk a bit about uh, what's a big challenge that we have to overcome to, to, to make this happen. Okay, I can go ahead since while we were talking about it. So a uh, big challenge is making sure that the assets we create stable coins of, which don't necessarily need to be real currencies. You can create a stable coin of a dollar. You can create that's actually a real one. <laughs> you can create a, a stable coin of ADA. That's what we will, we're going to be doing with Optin. It's a it's, it's, it's stable coin, follows the same principles. And we still need that ADA to be used as a reference asset for that token to be successful. Because then we can enhance the yield, we can do a lot of things with it. But without having a bigger market, without having a much bigger, more liquid market, any sort of stable coin will ultimately fail because it does not represent anything meaningful, real that it is attached to. You can even argue that the stable coin markets we have now will hit a natural limit at some point so because they will no longer be referencing anything and will be a creature, an enigma unto itself that references itself as the value. So is your challenge the demand? Yeah, 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 and that, that would be the, the CBDC the, uh, sort of vision. Okay, now we're not referencing anything other than itself. Yeah. That is the real thing. Like ADA is a stable coin of ADA technically, issued by a programmatic system of algorithms and stake pools. Huh? Challenge? Challenge, barriers. I, I, I'm hopeful that the US regulatory system will catch up. Uh, I've been working with 50 different regulators at 50 different states, trying to explain to them exactly what we're doing. And luckily the path that we're trotting is, is known because it's the same one that USDC and a few of the other larger stable coins on Ethereum have taken. And it's a fairly well known path. But when we really get into it, it's more important that federal regulators understand what we're doing, that, uh, that, 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 that the banks that are associated with those federal regulators are also understanding of, of what stable coins are and how necessary they are and what asset tokenization means. And this, this whole adoption curve that needs to be accelerated so that Cardano and the other L1s can all be a meaningful, make a meaningful contribution to the world. Yeah, yeah I think the regulation is super important and, and ultimately I guess when you have that regulatory and legal certainty about some of these tokens then you, can, you, you just know that the demand is there waiting to come in, but it's just kind of at the door waiting for that certainty that they can start interacting yeah. and adopting. Well, so if you look at, if you want to do your, your Law 101 take on all of this, your basic pre-law 
theory is look at the action and see what it, it actually is and see what laws would apply to it. And so if you were to look at the action of a stablecoin issuer, there's not necessarily the same type of thing that we, some, some, some specific law that would apply to it, but there are laws that would apply to it. The problem is nobody's actually looking at the actions that we're taking. I see. Because the action, actual actions that we're taking are very clean, very clear, very transparent, and should be, should be you know, widespread. And there should be some, maybe some regulation that, that governs the way we manage the reserves or our transparency or those other things. But the, the, the actual action of taking a dollar from somebody, putting it on blockchain, it's not, it's not so crazy. Yeah. But nobody really wants to actually look at that action. They just want to say, well, ah, blockchain, blockchain, out, 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 out. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you. Connie? Um, what I think is, um, and I'm, I'm stealing something from, from both of you, is trust at scale. So we want three things. We want good, liquid operating markets that a lot of people can interact with. We want interoperability, and not just interoperability of blockchains. Yes, that's a good place to start, but let's let the other assets also interoperable, be interoperable with each other. Let's get wallets to be interoperable. Let's get people and their identities to be interoperable as well. And then the last thing is that you, um, so I said trust at scale. So Sorry, I've lo lost my third point now. How embarrassing. So we said regulations, liquidity, and then interoperability Ability is is the the third point. So when when liquidity starts bridging the gap between trust and interoperability, we're actually going to see markets that are starting to become dynamic, markets that are starting to to flow, uh, markets that we don't need to have a fight around what is the ultimate asset and what is the ultimate stablecoin, yep. because we have pools of value being being traded with each other. So unless we actually start working on that trusted scale and working working at um, some of the problem statements that underpin the um, principle-based regulations that you just mentioned, we are not going to actually see this market becoming um, the dream that we're all sitting here with hoping to become a reality. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point. I think fragmentation is something, I feel like the world is going through this kind of, we went through globalization, now we're trying to fragmenting and hopefully, it, it's kind of funny because blockchain is very decentralized and then, you, but you do need to create these sort of central pools of liquidity, but I think your point about interoperability is really, really important because you want to make sure everything can talk to each other so then we have bigger pools of liquidity to draw on when you want to go and do business. Um, so that's super important. But look, at, we're, we're out of time um, and it's been awesome, like really, really interesting conversation. Really, thank you very much, Connie, Matt, and, and Zygo for your time. Um, it's great to, to talk through everything with you. And, and, and it's amazing being at this point in history where we're, we're, we're seeing this adoption of digital assets and only, you know, time will only tell in the next, you know, five, 10 years what will happen and hopefully we'll, we'll come back to future summits to discuss it further. But thank you very much and thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Riz. Thank you.